is not every day that we get to meet a real American hero. During his 20 years as a naval aviator, including 13 years with NASA, Captain Eugene Cernan left his mark on history with not one but three historic missions in space. As the pilot of Gemini 9, my introduction just disappeared. He did a lot of really great stuff. <laughs> he was the pilot of Apollo 10's lunar module and the commander of Apollo 17. After flying to the moon not once but twice, he also holds the distinction of being the second person to do a spacewalk, and he is the last man to ever set foot on the surface of the lunar, of the lunar planet, of the moon. Captain Cernan authored his book, The Last Man on the Moon, in 1999, and this year it was just made into a documentary, and we were talking about it beforehand, and we're all going to want to make sure that we get a chance to see the documentary of the same name, The Last Man on the Moon. Please help me in welcoming Captain Gene Cernan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. You and I were talking about your daughter who uh, knows more about what went on in the space program a zillion years ago than obviously you do. So you better check. Where'd you go? You better check with her. A pleasure to be here, Tom. Thank you for that, uh, that introduction. Uh, I asked you to keep it short, and I appreciate that when someone gets uh, really long-winded and tells you all about a person that you don't really care to know or what you're going to forget about, there's a line I didn't get to use because you were too short, and that is uh, you get up here and you tell the folks you feel just like Liz Taylor's seventh husband. You, uh, you think you know what to do, but after that presentation we had a minute ago, I don't know if I can make it interesting. You didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> it is a pleasure. I, uh, Mark, I want to thank you for the invitation to be here this morning. Uh, I uh, also want to welcome you folks from all over the world to Texas. We're really a very friendly place to give you an idea that uh, we are very, very proud of. Uh, I live in Houston, transplanted from uh, the Chicago area. Uh, I, uh, our previous governor, Governor Perry, I'd been here some over 40 years at the time. And I asked him, uh, how about making me an honorary Texan? And he said, Gene, he said, I can make you an admirable admiral in the, uh, in the Texas Navy, but only God can make you an honorary Texan. So now you know what you're up against when you come to Texas. We are pretty proud. You know, I, I, I graduated from Purdue as an engineer, uh, you know, just about a month after God. Well, so did Neil Armstrong, how about that? Uh, just about a month after God created water, I, uh, so by education, I'm an engineer. By profession, I call myself a naval aviator. I had an opportunity to go to the moon, and so people think I'm a technological genius. And I want to promise you, after witnessing that previous presentation, I got to admit, when I have a problem, I call my grandkids. <laughs> I call my grandkids. I'm gonna, it's gonna be a little change of pace here this morning, I'm not going to talk with you uh, about utilizing Siemens PLM for managing a software suite or how do you manage an entire life cycle of products. You are going to be overloaded, I think, with that before this week is over, and you're going to, I think, walk away a lot more knowledgeable than you are today. And I want to echo something that was said by Tom earlier when we started this session. Do interface with each other out there, uh, the people you don't know. I, uh, I have spent a lot of time over the last two decades in aviation safety, and we have several major seminars, one in Wichita every year. And I've been flying over 50 years, my entire life, 
and I never leave one of those events, three or four day events, that I don't learn something new about aviation and flying and particular, particularly uh, flight safety. Uh, technology. Having been in the aviation profession for a long time, I have seen the elevation, the evolution of, of technology come to the point where it has over, almost overtaken the cockpit. And I'm not proud to say, but that in corporate aviation, probably over 80% of the accidents emanate from the cockpit. And over 50% of those accidents are caused by the fact that the crew is absolutely 100 dependent upon that technology. Now that technology was designed is in all of your professions, and I know there's a lot of users out there to make it more efficient, more effective, more cost effective, safer, no matter what your profession is, but it is not meant to take over your responsibility. And I have, I have something, I, I'm not a preacher, but I try and repeat this over and over and over again, and I think it's as important in your profession that it is as it is in mine. Use technology as an aid, not a crutch. I don't care how quickly, you know, today's technology is obsolete tomorrow morning. I don't care how quickly we innovate, create whatever the the, 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 the best computer in the world that I don't believe can ever be duplicated is between the ears. Use technology as an aid and not a crutch. There's one other thing I want to say. In my days during the space program, I look back at the folks out there, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, and uncles, who gave us the opportunity to get our picture in a paper. We were the, literally, simply the tip of the arrow. The real strength behind the bow, the people who designed the technology, the shaft, and the guidance for those feathers, are those folks out there who took ownership of everything they did. By ownership, I mean, when we launched to the moon, we didn't go alone. We went with over a half a million people, people who put the bolts in the heat shield, who put the wiring in the spacecraft, who put the Velcro on the bulkhead. And they knew, and what was more important, we knew, that what they took ownership of was not gonna fail. They accepted the responsibility that, and that, that what, they, the, the part, and it wasn't a small part, but the part they played in getting us to the moon and home safely was as significant as any of us who were using that technology and their product in the spacecraft. So what you folks down there in the trenches might be doing or the people you've got back home in the trenches you really need to tell them that what they do is significant to some individual out there on the end of the line. No matter what he's using that technology for, uh, from designing a system that is significantly important to operate uh, a jet engine, or for someday that somebody is gonna depend upon him for something that he designs, and is responsible for to get us not just back to the moon, um, but uh, on to Mars. Those are the people who really made it possible for those of us who, uh, who went to the moon. And I've often been asked a question, did I ever think about not getting home? Well, I think we all did, but we never talked about it. Uh, we were too macho at the time, but my personal feelings were uh, I knew, I didn't go to the moon not to come home. And the reason I felt that way is because we went down and worked. We were the users and worked down and put the user's input into the evolution of that spacecraft. 
and we work with the people, and we saw those people putting the, putting the bolts in the heat shield. Maybe only once in the course of two or three or four or five years, but we saw them, we knew who they were, and they knew who we were, and we had their guarantees, and that was as important as anything in the world. So we were the tip of the arrow. We got our picture in the newspaper, but the real heroes of the space program are those folks back home. As I said, your aunts, your uncles, grandparents, and I hear that all the time from people today. So I'm not gonna touch the details of what was talked about here this morning, because I'm just, uh, you know, I'm looking at almost two full generations of folks out here younger than I am. Uh, and a world you're growing up in and, uh, and, and living with is uh, almost beyond my compression. So comprehensive. So what I'd really like to do is uh, take you back in history because 40, 50, 60 years ago, most of you weren't even born. And those who were, were in grade school or high school and barely remember a piece of history that either has been overlooked, forgotten, or just passed us by. I want to tell you how, how, our, how our voyage to this, voyages to the moon began, because it was back in the early 60s. Uh, when this country was involved in what we, we remember and we lived through the terrible 60s, and I know most of you don't understand what that is. This country, the United States of America, was torn by civil strife, campus unrest, the beginnings of what became a very, very unpopular war. The Soviet Union was our Cold War enemy. We were literally at war with them at the time. Uh, the Soviets owned space. Sputnik had gone up a couple years earlier. Yuri Gagarin had orbited the Earth, the first human being in space had orbited the Earth one time in April of 1961. And this country of ours was desperately looking for a hero. And that hero happened to be a gentleman named Alan Shepard. And Alan went up, suborbital went up for a grand total of 16 minutes. Did not get in orbit. John Glenn flight was almost a year away. Alan went up and came down. 16 minutes of space flight experience. And three weeks later, under the umbrella of the terrible 60s and Soviet domination in space, a young president, John F. Kennedy, said, okay, folks, I guess we're ready to go to the moon. He challenged this nation of ours to do what most people thought was impossible, what most people thought couldn't be done. I, was a, I wasn't in the space program. I was, made a couple cruises to Westpac over Western Pacific off aircraft carriers. I came back, and I was one of those people who listened to him and said, it can't be done. How are we going to do that? And he challenged this country beyond our wildest dreams. He challenged our spirit. He challenged our industrial might. He challenged our commitment to the future. And he did it under this umbrella of what I say is a terrible 60s. Was, was Kennedy a, a dreamer, a visionary? Politically astute, the answer is probably yes. Yes to all three. Uh, and, and that challenge led to what, and I think it's evident by what we saw this morning and what you'll see the rest of the week, probably one of the most significant technological endeavors in modern mankind. It, it certainly gave birth, I believe, to the digital the digital world we now live in. Because, as I said, we didn't know beans about going on the moon. The technology didn't exist. It was an idea. It was an idea that had, had to be transformed into hardware, planning, missions, and execution. And history is effectively uh, 
written the rest of that story. But I think even more than a technological endeavor, it was probably one of the most significant endeavors, certainly in my lifetime, because that endeavor required the, the effort, the determination, the self-sacrifice, the dedication, the commitment of thousands and thousands of Americans. And it also required the vision of a very bold and young president at the time. That human endeavor required us to, to, to dared us to dream about Kennedy's challenge, required this nation to reach as a team of people beyond where we've ever reached before. Think about that. 16 minutes of space flight and we're gonna go to the moon. And it required a human endeavor of people who were not afraid to fail and were willing to try. It was a human endeavor of, of immense, immense proportions. And perhaps along the way, we had to prove who we were and what we could do. Because we knew as as a team of people at the time, uh, we might lose somebody along the way. But never, ever did we believe or dream that we would lose somebody like we did on Apollo 1, a whole crew, before we ever got, literally got off the ground. Oh, we had success in Mercury. We had success in Gemini, which was the bridge, which was to develop and create those techniques and procedures and technologies that was gonna to lead to Apollo and eventually get us, get us to the moon. And we became very confident, maybe overconfident, because I think probably there's enough technical understanding in this, in this room this morning. We, because our boosters could not lift the payload that was required to have a spacecraft that could contain 14.7 PSI, pounds of pressure, air pressure, uh, because of the strength and the size of the, uh, of, of the payload of the, of the spacecraft. We went down to five PSI, 100% oxygen. That's fine. From a pressure point of view, we can live with that, and that's more than enough oxygen we leave, need to breathe. So all of our flights, when we got in orbit, were five PSI oxygen. But we had to test that spacecraft, the integrity of that spacecraft on the ground. And we had to pump that, that five PSI oxygen up into 16 PSI oxygen. So your Apollo 1 crew was in a, was in a spacecraft with 16, point, 16 PSI, 100% oxygen. You snap your fingers and you might have an explosion, and that's exactly what happened. We got overconfident uh, because of our success. That taught us a lesson. We learned a lot of things from the Apollo 1 fire. And I remember back in February of 1967, we were walking behind the caissons on a cold, rainy day at Arlington, and I wasn't sure whether we were bearing three of our friends and colleagues or whether we were bearing the entire Apollo program. But we're resist, uh, a resilient people, and it wasn't but just a little more than 18 months. We were back in space. And we were very successful. And when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon on Apollo 11 in, Jan in, in July of 1969, and by the way, part of the president's commitment and challenge was not only one are we gonna, are we gonna go to the moon, we're gonna get there before the end of the decade. So we were on a, we had a speed trial along the way. And he also said we're gonna get there, well he didn't say it, but we all knew we meant it, that we're gonna get there before the other guy got there. And, and we did both. 
And then came along Apollo 13, because here we're again, we're 12 was successful, 11 was successful, 12 was successful. Man, we're on our way. And we knew we were vulnerable to a whole host of problems, most of which we could identify, many of which we could not. And one of them that we could not identify was what happened on Apollo 13 when an oxygen tank uh, blew up. But that may be NASA's Apollo 13 in those 48 hours may be NASA's finest moment. Because you've heard the words failure was not an option, but I, I was on the next crew, I was backup on the next crew. So I was very much involved with how do we solve the problems of Apollo 13. And I will tell you what, in those first 24 hours, failure was an option. But everybody who was anybody involved in the program at that point in time, from one end of the country to another, not just mission control, took off their badges and threw them in a pile, academia, the, the, the private sector, the NASA, the government sector, Everybody became a single team with a single purpose, and that was to bring those guys home. And, and we, you look for solutions. Initially, there were no solutions. They, they were people who had to innovate and create and, and, and with, with the hardware we had to work with and the software was up there. Just we couldn't send them more stuff. We had to utilize what we had. And as an example of what can be done when the chips are down, what example of what, what, what teamwork is really all about, and the significance and importance of it, uh, when we need an answer at a critical time like that, uh, Apollo 13, I don't think, can be uh, equalized. Any, any experiences that I've had. There again, are we gonna end the space program? Is it worth it to go on? Decisions were made that we would go on. And we went on with Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17. All very, very successful missions. Each one built upon what we had learned on a previous mission. Particularly what we learned from Apollo 1 through Apollo 13, and then those normal things we expected to build on through Apollo, Apollo 17. The other thing, by the way, that they used, which became very handy on Apollo 17, which I'll show you here in a minute, was a, uh, a uh, does that mean I got three minutes? I don't think so. Uh, I hope not. Uh, was duct tape. Because they had duct tape on the flight on Apollo 13, and without it, they could not have made a round lithium hydroxide canister fit into a square hole. We got the brightest engineers in the world during that period of time with NASA. We had two different spacecraft, and one had a canister with a round hole, and one had a canister with a square hole. We ran into a lot of those things when we thought we were the smartest people in the world we would run into those kind of obstacles along the way, and it would sure, uh, it would sure develop a little humility, quite frankly. Now, let me, uh, let me just say something else about Apollo 13 and the human endeavor that was involved with that, getting those guys home. We had people who were willing to do with others wouldn't do. You can't do that. It won't work. It's not worth it. It might explode. Or what others just simply couldn't do. Or sometimes what others were afraid to do. So keep in mind, don't be afraid to do what others wouldn't do, couldn't do, were afraid to do. If you think it's the right thing to do, if you think what you're doing is the right thing to do, and you are willing to accept the challenge and risk to get it done, that in my mind, that's my definition of what 
the right stuff is. And I think everyone in this audience today who is willing to look at it in that fashion truly indeed has the right stuff. Now let me, let me, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, looking back at what Neil did and, and all those 20 folks from 28 and other countries can understand where I'm coming from. I think when Neil stepped on the moon, with all that this country had to go through to get him there, probably demonstrated, to me anyway, one of the most visible examples of something I'm very proud of, and that's American exceptionalism. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is nobody who could have handled what came after that mission, Apollo 11, being the first man on the moon with more dignity than did Neil Armstrong, and you can be proud of that fact. Now, let me, uh, let me take you on a quick trip to the moon. Uh, but first, I want to talk to you about what it's like to be in Earth orbit. When you travel in Earth orbit, you're going around this Earth at 18,000 miles an hour. On my spacewalk, I was the second American to walk in space. We knew nothing about what we were doing, but that's a whole other story. I walked across the Atlantic Ocean in 15 minutes. That's 15 minutes. That's crazy. But you travel around the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour, about 200 miles above the surface of the Earth, and you, you, you fly over a river, or a coastline, an ocean, a city, and if you're lucky, you might even get a glimpse of your own hometown. But let me tell you, when you go to the moon, when you leave, this, leave the, home, the, the comforting confines of Earth orbit and accelerate to 25,000 miles an hour, it's a different space program. It's different technologically because of the requirements. It's different philosophically because you truly are in a different environment, in a different world, and it's different it's a different space program spiritually because when you look back, and I'll get into that in a minute, back at the Earth from the moon, it's not like flying around it at 18,000 miles an hour. And as you head on out in a few hours, you look back, that, Earth, that horizon in Earth orbit is slightly curved. When you look back, when you look back uh, after about two or three hours and uh, back at the Earth, that uh, horizon is closed around and upon itself and showing you something very strange and yet something very familiar. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, you look for the strings that are holding it up, but they're not there. You look for the fulcrum on that desk where you've got a globe and it's not there. But the earth, it, you, you can begin to look from no longer are you flying around it. You begin to look from the turquoise blues of the Caribbean across, across the, the, the plains, the deserts, and the mountains of North and South America and the deep dark blues of the Pacific, and you can do that all with one simple glance. Uh, you're no longer flying around the world. You're watching it evolve in, in, in right smack in front of you. you, you you literally, as you head on out, see something different, something changing, because the Earth is turning on its axis, and every 24 hours you're looking at the other side of the world, a world that's covered with the blues of the oceans and the whites of the cloud, snow in the clouds. You can look literally from Antarctica. I'll show you a picture in a minute, all the way up across two continents into the, into the uh, icebergs of, of the... Uh, North Atlantic and of the North Pole. I want to real quick, this is my crew, uh, another naval aviator, the ball-headed guy up on top, the guy to the left of him is a lunar geologist, the only scientist to fly in the program. It made sense for a lunar geologist to go to the moon, and this was the last flight and the last chance. That was a lunar rover. Uh, we, we drove a lunar rover on the moon. That was our booster, the Saturn V. There we are at, uh, we launched at night, the only Apollo flight to launch at night. Uh, why? Because that's when we had to launch to get to where we wanted to land with the sun where we wanted it on the moon. It's, a, it's, it's not complicated, but it is a lot of geometry involved. Here's our night launch. 
I was told by many who saw it, it was like the world lit up from, within, from outside. I will tell you, sitting on top of that, I could see the light reflected from the cloudless sky up there. It was, I've been on that Saturn V twice. Daytime is one thing, nighttime is another. It's a fantastic experience to be on top of that thing, and if any of you ever get a chance, take it. <laughs> this is what we look like from, uh, in a time shot from Orlando as we headed out into, we went into Earth orbit first, and then we headed out, accelerated our spacecraft to 25,000 miles an hour. And you know, when I say that to you, I'm wondering, you know, if I sound crazy, but I've been there four times, twice going and twice coming back. That's when the world begins to evolve as you head on out away from it. That's a very interesting part of the world today, by the way. That's the Indian Ocean, that's Africa, this is the Middle East. You know, lots going on there today. That just happened to be the first picture we were able to take when we came out of the darkness into daylight and started crossing the coast of Africa. Mediterranean is on the top. Doesn't take too long when, that, as I said, that horizon closes in upon itself and you are looking at the entirety of the world. We launched in December, that's the Iron Attic, at Antarctic down below. So you can see the ice cap is broken away, all of Africa up into the Med. Some 12 hours later, two things happen. The world gets small very, very quickly at first. And that's North America, because now we're looking at the other side of the world. Baja, California, the Gulf of Mexico, down in the right-hand corner is, uh, is uh, South America, up on top is the Arctic, and that was our destination. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. That was our destination, uh, and there is a man on the moon. If you look closely, there he is, two eyes and oath, uh, nose, and uh, we landed in an area, I'll show you in a minute, that uh, had mountains on three sides higher than the Grand Canyon is deep. It was uh, a pretty exciting place in which to land. And by the way, with all the technology we had, and, by, and, and you know, as I said earlier, the technology that we eventually evolved into on the last flight of Apollo didn't exist. But the final answer that the technology we had was everyone who landed on the moon did it with his two bare hands his eyeballs and his brain. We use the technology to a certain point, at which point the technology was not good enough to make a safe land. And the other side of that coinage were all aviators, and you think you're gonna go to the moon and let a computer land there? Not in a million years. Anyway, that was our lunar module. Uh, yeah? Q&A has blown up. We have a okay, ton, let me so. go through it. There's one Excellent. thing I gotta say. Maybe we can get it in the Q&A. I know I... We started late, but I didn't know what that thing went to zero. Tom? <laughs> uh, totally fine. There, uh, let, me, let me just say this, because I want to share this. The answer to what does the Earth look like? When you're headed out to the moon and you look back home, you are truly in a different world. It is, it is philosophically and spiritually different because you're looking at back home at the Earth, a three-dimensional, multicolored blues uh, of, of the oceans and the, and the whites of the snow and the clouds, three-dimensionally inside this infinite blackness I call the endlessness of space and time. And the Earth is moving with purpose and with logic and with beauty beyond your comprehension. I don't believe in coincidences. There was no strings holding it up. It was just too beautiful from my point of view to have happened by accident. I happened spiritually, this is not a religious statement, but spiritually happened to, when I was on the moon, and we can get to that if you like, I sat on God's front porch for three days of my life and looked back at a small piece and part of his creation. And if you don't come back 
with some philosophical, spiritual feeling like that. I happen to believe you missed the big part of the trip. Now, we got questions. You got some. <laughs> There's a few of us batting around on the moon. Here's one I like. That was our home on the moon. Long way away. We travel over 36 kilometers in this vehicle. Don't leave home without it. Duct tape. <laughs> I knocked a fender off. <laughs> And there was no 24-hour roadside assistance. But fortunately, because of Apollo 13, we took duct tape. And that was one of my favorites. We came home. We looked like a coal miner. We, uh, that was our liftoff. You've probably seen that on, our, uh, on a different place, Earthrise. And uh, we're home. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry I took a little long. Right. I didn't know what that clock meant. It, went, <laughs> it started at 42 and went to zero. I, didn't, I wasn't up there that long, but go ahead. Tom, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> now I can get to it. Now we got questions. And, and I just want to say you hate to have to be the guy who has to interrupt an American no, I'm hero. Glad you did. Hey, what inspired you, Captain, to become an astronaut? I'm going to try and be shorter than longer. <laughs> As a kid, growing up during World War II, like most kids, I had a dream. And we're all inspired by somebody, something that happened in our lifetime. And hopefully, what we did a couple of decades, a few decades ago, has inspired young people. And hopefully, it inspired some of you to do and become what you are. I watched the Unsung heroes of World War II make flying machines in the Pacific do the impossible. I wanted to become a naval aviator. I wanted to fly airplanes off an aircraft carrier. That took me through my, that was a dream that was so far out it was truly unreachable at the time. My dad and mom had a dream of me to get the education they never got. They never had a chance to go to college. And coupled with that dream and my dream, I ended up at Purdue. Naval ROTC went into Navy flight training. And when Alan Shepard's flight occurred, I was asked, how would I like to do that? And I said, by the time I get good enough, all the pioneering will be done. There won't be anything left to do. Little did I know, never count yourself out. Because it was about three years later, and I didn't even apply. I got a call from the Navy, said they wanted to recommend me to NASA for further evaluation. One day I found myself in a hotel ballroom in Houston, old Rice Hotel, with 400 of the finest aviators that ever existed in, in this country. Combat experience, um, uh, broke every altitude record, every speed record. They were there and me. I was just hoping maybe I'll get to meet an astronaut while I'm there and be able to tell my daughter like you're, you're gonna do. <laughs> uh, and one thing left to the next, and, and uh, I was selected as one of the 14. Uh, I, I, why me? I can ask myself that question over and over again. I went to Arlington recently and looked at some of my colleagues' headstones. Why me? Why are they there and I'm here? Why am I on this stage? What did I, why did I go to the moon? Fate, F-A-T-E, plays such a major role in our lives. Never overlook it and never, ever count yourself out and pass that on to your kids and your grandkids. My dad told me one thing, and here's the answer to your question. He said, growing up, he said, son, I'm only going to ask one thing of you, and that's to do your best. You're not going to be better than everyone at everything, but sooner or later, you're going to surprise yourself. Dads are generally right, aren't they, if we ever listen to them. <laughs> Excellent. So, as NASA maybe goes back to the moon or goes to Mars, what do you think the technological benefits will be that will oh, come to man, mankind? Man, I tell you what, we, you, we're going to go back to the moon and we're going to go on to Mars as soon as we get things straight in Washington. <laughs> uh, and why? You know, when Kennedy said, why go on the moon in the first place, he, he said, because, uh, you know, the guy, the guy climbed uh, Mount Everest said, because it's there. Well, we're going to go to the moon because of other reasons. We're going to go to the moon because there's a lot of commercial benefits to go, and I won't even go into those. We're going to go because we need to get prepared to go to Mars. We're going to have long-duration stays on the moon. And we're going to go to Mars eventually 
because curiosity is the essence of human existence. Who are we? Where are we? What's it like to be on Mars? What's it like to go to the moon? It's, it's in our nature to explore. We want to we wanna know what's around the corner. We want to know what's over the top of the hill. We want to know what it feels like, what it looks like. And the meaning from, which, from that which we do will follow, will follow. So if man goes to Mars, how do you feel about what's being talked about, about a mission no, where they don't come no, home? No, we're not going to go and not come home. That's crazy. Why would you do that? I said a minute ago, I didn't go to the moon not to come home. You know, if that's somebody's idea, I don't, there's someone in this world of ours who will volunteer to do anything. <laughs> and no, there, I, I think there's little or no benefit of sending people on a one-way trip to Mars. If we're good enough to send them there, we're good enough to bring them home. So the, the app and Twitter were sort of burning up while you were speaking with questions. And my favorite question from the audience is, while you were on the moon, did you find any of Alan Shepard's golf balls? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was Alan Shepard's backup. He surprised everyone with that. Uh, we landed on six different areas on the moon, hundreds of miles apart. So what I will tell you, I think they're still there. He claims he hit one of them in orbit. You know, you're dealing with one six gravity and no, no atmospheric drag. So if you hit a golf ball, uh, you get hit it pretty far. I played golf with Alan, on, <laughs> not on the moon, on the earth. <laughs> and I don't think he was good enough to hit a golf ball in the orbit. <laughs> So what do you think, in your opinion, is the future of NASA and our space program? Well, right now it's pretty bleak. Uh, 42 years ago, folks, how do you feel about this? Tom, I, you talked to me about your daughter, how excited and enthusiastic she is. 42 years ago, I walked on the moon. I lived there for 75 hours. I drove a car on the moon. <laughs> There's a story behind that, too. But how do you feel about the fact that today we cannot put an American in space on a made in America rocket? How do you feel about that? We were launched into the moon on that big Saturn V, the largest wor rocket in the world, successful, never failed, every 60 days in the early part of the, of the Apollo program. And today, of course, that rocket doesn't exist, and today we can't get an American to our own space station. How do you feel? I don't feel very good about it. If, if, Kennedy, if Kennedy were alive today, he'd be very distraught, quite frankly. That's not what he had in mind. He said, we're going to go to the moon and do the other things. Well, we started to do the other things, and we had a program called Constellation six years ago that was going to take us to, moon, to the moon by about 2020. Hardware was built. Prototypes were built. Uh, the planning was in, in, in process. And from there, it was going to leapfrog us to Mars probably a decade or so after we went, went back to the moon. That's all vaporized today. So you mentioned that you drove a car on the moon. How far did you go in that, in that limb? Well, I went a total of some 36 kilometers. We explored that whole valley. It was like 20, 20 miles long, five miles wide. We went places we never could have gone had we walked. And I owned, I owned the, uh, had a little discussion with one of the uh, uh, Formula One drivers, but uh, he didn't believe this. But I, 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 would, I hold a speed record, 14 kilometers downhill. Okay, that's not very fast, right? But when you add the speed of the moon around the earth, <laughs> uh, I, I can't tell you a minute ago, go ahead, you got another no, one, keep give going. it to me. No, give it to me. <laughs> so what, um, what do you think about the canceling then of the shuttle program? Because you mentioned you didn't like the well, the you know, stopping that's, going that's, to the moon. Well, there was another part. That, when the Constellation included the development of a rocket, of an Ares rocket, in stages, and, and the plan when the Ares rocket got complete, we were going to cancel the shuttle, which made sense because the shuttle had 
Without the shuttle, we never would have been able to build a space station. But the space station was built. Now we needed to service it. Now we needed to take people there. So it came time to retire the shuttle in spite of the fact that it literally had another 25 years of lifetime in it. Uh, and uh, this area was going to be our access to our own space station. Constellation got canceled. Aries went with it. And, uh, and so uh, the timetable to cancel shuttle was still out there. So when the time came, the powers that be said, well, let's cancel space shuttle with nothing, nothing on the horizon to replace it. And there's still, notwithstanding what's going on in the private sector, which I strongly support, but it's not quite that private because it's using taxpayers' money, just a different way to use it. It's going to be a while before we put a human being on one of those things. We've made some mistakes in the past. We killed some colleagues. We had our ticker tape parades, but we paid dearly for them. And I don't want to see that happen again in the future. We got a lot of smart people out there, a lot of, let me, let me tell you, I could not have become an astronaut today competing against some of the young men and young women that are involved in the space program. I'm not smart enough. I, I'm not, I don't think I could have handled it. I don't know that I could understand all this technology you, young, you, you, you folks are living with and processing and creating and, and putting out there. It, I, I'm telling you, I was I, I boggled by what I heard this morning about what's going on. I, I'm just overwhelmed. And I guess you know, at po this point in life, if I can learn to use my iPhone, I've, I've got it <laughs> So everything that you experienced in the space program, how does that relate to our audience and their careers? What can they learn from what you did to get to the moon for their own career? I tell you, it, 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 it takes, you got to believe very strongly, as I said a minute ago, that what you're doing individually and collectively is the right thing to do. And you truly, you, you truly have to know that you're not going to be able to get it done alone. You, it, 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 the quality of people that something as exciting, as dynamic, as challenging uh, of the space program not only requires, but all of a sudden, the people are knocking on a door to be part of it. They want to be part of what's going on. Those are the people, uh, as I said, who truly make it, truly make it possible. What can you learn? Believe that what you're doing is as important as the guy who is using your creation, who is using what you de develop, using the idea that, that, that came through the process it became a realistic piece of hardware or a piece of software. Know that that person, whether he's making truck tires or medical equipment, I got, I, I, that medical thing impressed me. I may have some of your, some of Siemens hardware in me. I got two <laughs> hips. I got two hips and four knees. I only use two of them at a time. Replacements, <laughs> replacements. You know, I, and I, I don't run as fast as I used to, but, but I'm here. Because of that, because of somebody came up with that idea a long time ago. And I depend upon those. I depend upon those hips. So that person out there, and I don't know who they were, he or the or she were, but God bless them because they believe that, that the, the person who was ultimately going to use that piece of hardware depended on it. And I do. So going to the moon, driving a truck, flying an airplane, Walking with a with a, a replacement medical device somewhere in your body <laughs> is very significant to the user. So those people who are the idea, the creators, you are you are as important piece of the equation as anyone who controls the throttle of an airplane. So you talk about your hips and your knees, but what do you do to stay so spry and healthy? We had a conversation this morning, and you seem 10 or 15 years younger than you are. What do you do to stay, you know, to stay healthy? Oh, oh, you know, I'm so old. When I mentioned the name Phil Harris, he was a comic, worked for Bob Hope and one thing or another. He had a, he had a saying, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd take a better care of myself. <laughs> uh, I never, I'm 81 years old, uh, you know, never, who would have believed it? I, I didn't, I, I don't now. But 
But you know, you, you, you do, you, I don't know how, I don't, I'm not, I'm not an exercise nut, although I try and stay in shape. I'm the worst eater in the world. You know, I'm, I'm a hamburger eater and a french fry eater and all those other things, but uh, uh, it, it just, I don't know. That's a tough question, uh, you know. It, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I, I keep coming back, though, to, to this thing that I do want to share with people. Literally, let me, let me maybe finish because your time may be up. People ask me, I, I had a million questions last night. I wanted to answer them all today, and obviously there was no time. What's it feel like to take those first steps on the moon? Well, the first steps have been taken long before I got there. But those were my first steps. And I was, as I explained to you how I got in the space program, I, wouldn't even, I, I didn't even volunteer because I didn't qualify. I didn't meet NASA's requirements. So I've always looked at myself even in athletics and high school or wherever, somewhat of an underdog. But following my dad's advice to do my best and looking for the day I might surprise myself, I just stayed with it and stayed with it. So when I landed and stepped on the moon, I had flown twice, but in the right seat, in the co-pilot seat. This was commander. Now I was given responsibility for the success of a mission and for the survival of my crew to get, I was responsible for getting the job done. Was I good enough? When I stepped on the surface of the moon, I proved to myself, I didn't have to prove to you, Tom, or anybody else. When I made those first steps on the moon, I proved to myself I could do it. I proved to myself, yes, I indeed was good enough. That my dad, that my dad really had some good, good advice. Uh, I didn't worry about not, I didn't say, well, you must have thought about coming home. I didn't worry about what was going to happen three days later. You worry about that when the time comes. Uh, I knew we were going to get out of there. And if we didn't, if we didn't, we wouldn't be here. Uh, and the other thing, people ask me, well, what about the last steps? And when I left the surface of the moon and climbed up that ladder and I looked down at those footprints of mine, uh, I knew I wasn't coming this way again, but somebody else would. And I needed to bring home something to give to you, to give the people back home. And what, what, why did we go? What was the importance of what we did? I knew we were an extension of, of technology, but what was the meaning, not just of Apollo 17, but of the entire program, everyone who walked, what, what was the meaning of human beings at this point in history living on another planet and calling it their home. And I, 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 I look back at, at the earth and, and, and I was looking at it as, as perhaps we've only seen it before through the words of poets or the, uh, the paintings of artists or maybe through the minds of philosophers. And I knew I'd been somewhere special. And that's when I came up with my answer that I'd literally been sitting on God's front porch and I wanted to reach out into that blackness and in that three-dimensional blackness and grab the magnificent home we live on and tuck it in here, bring it back and bring it here this morning and say, here, here's what it looks like. Now you, you tell me how you feel. And I obviously couldn't do that. And I, even to this day, I wrote that book. I, I took you everywhere that I had been in my life. I you, took you on my spacewalk. I took you to the moon. I took you so that hopefully you could answer that question yourself. You really have to let your imagination wander to take yourself back to the moon where I've been fortunate, fortunate enough to go. Uh, but the last steps really pretty nostalgic to me because uh, if we could have stayed, we would. If I could go back, I'd leave tomorrow. Um, but it isn't going to happen, so I have to live with that memory and that question of why me and not somebody else. And, but why not you? Why not your kids? Why not? It can and it does happen. I tell, and tell your daughter to take the word impossible out of her vocabulary. If I can go to the moon, 
before half of this audience was born. What can't you do and what can't your kids do? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Eugene Cernan. Well, we almost made it. We're okay. Almost made it. <laughs> no, Thank you made. very much. They love Thank it. Thank you. Thank you.